welcome to Stand By Us 2021, an online forum exploring the intersections of multi-gender attraction. Whether you identify as bi, pan, queer, questioning, or any other label, or no label at all, we're delighted to have you here with us. We're coming to you from many different traditional lands of First Nations peoples, such as Ghana land of the Adelaide Plains, South Australia. Wurrung land, Nam, Melbourne, Victoria. Gadigal land in the Eora Nation. Larrakia saltwater peoples land in Larrakia country, Darwin, Northern Territory. From Kulin Nation, Bolan Bolan land, now called Bulleen, a suburb of Melbourne in Victoria. Bulu on Wajak, Noongar, Budja, Perth, WA. I'm standing on the land of the Mumarimana people of the Palawa Nation in Lutrobita, Tasmania. I'm on Mijibul Arakul country in the Bunjalung Nation, Northern Rivers, New South Wales. While you're up on Wajak Noongar Buja. The Bogomata land of the Durag Nation, Bowen Mountain, New South Wales. Hello to you, wherever you are, across Australia or around the world. All land in Australia is Aboriginal land and always will be. The land was never ceded and no treaty has ever been signed. We humbly and gratefully pay our respects to the Indigenous Elders of the past, the present and those yet to emerge. We also acknowledge Indigenous LGBTIQA plus people who have lived here since long before European colonisation. Reconciliation is an ongoing process and one that all of us need to contribute to and take responsibility for. We'd like to send out a very special welcome to any First Nations people who are joining us today. Done By Us is all about celebrating Bi Plus people, elevating Bi Plus voices and bringing an amazing community together. This is a discrimination free space. So please don't say anything offensive about any group of people. This is a harassment free space. If someone makes you feel uncomfortable, please contact one of the organisers. When you engage with other people at this event, please be respectful. You can find guidelines about this on our website. Some events might talk about difficult, upsetting or triggering topics. So please keep a tab on your mental health. If you feel anxious or overwhelmed, we encourage you to take some time out and make use of some of your personal coping mechanisms. Things that might work for you are mindful breathing, grounding yourself, comfort items, or something to eat. If you need urgent support, we recommend contacting a support line such as QLife, Lifeline, Kids Helpline or Rainbow Door. Most of all, we want you to know you are not alone. We're a big, bright, diverse community and we're glad you're a part of it. Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Thanks so much for that and for everyone um, who participated in pulling that video together. Um, welcome everyone and happy Bi Plus Visibility Day. My name is Amber and I use they them pronouns and it's my great honor to be with you here this morning for the 2021 Stand By Us Forum First Nations keynote. With that said, um, I'd like to um, begin by acknowledging that I'm situated on the land on, on the lands of the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation. This always is, was, and always been uh, Aboriginal land. As we celebrate BIPLUS Visibility Day, we have to remember that we can't have true liberation for BIPLUS people and communities without listening to First Nations folks and by taking action in solidarity with Indigenous communities. So thank you so much for being here with us today to listen and learn. And I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker for today, Todd Fernando. Todd um, is the new commissioner for LGBTIQ plus communities in Victoria and is a descendant of the Kalari peoples of the Wiradjuri nation and identifies as queer with pronouns he, him. 
Todd is a medical anthropologist and research fellow at the University of Melbourne and has extensive experience working with both First Nations and LGBTIQ plus communities. Todd is an accomplished consultant and facilitator experienced in reforming social policy and cultural safety frameworks in public and private sectors across Australia. In 2018, Todd founded the Curry Pride Victoria, an advocacy nation that campaigns for the social inclusion and advancement of Victoria's LGBTIQA Aboriginal community. He was also the chair of the United Nations International Indigenous Youth Sexual Health Committee, campaigning for the sexual health rights of humans facing oppressive regimes. Todd, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Um, can I uh, acknowledge that I'm situated on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in, in Naram in Melbourne um, and pay my respects to their ancestors um, and elders past, present and emerging. Um, can I also say that when I was sent the, um, uh, the Stand By Us forum opening video and uh, watched it with absolute excitement of how beautiful that acknowledgement of country right across Australia was um, and I, can I acknowledge that we're all meeting on, on, on different lands throughout Australia. Um, can I just say that, that that video really shows how solidarity works and I congratulate the organisers um, for achieving such a great um, outcome with it. Um, I'm excited uh, that as the next commissioner for LGBTIQ plus communities, I get to open the Stand By Us Forum uh, for 2021. Um, what an incredible achievement of collaboration um, that you have all put together. Um, so congratulations to the organizing committee for that work. Um, can I also <laughs> acknowledge um, by Visibility Day today, um, and I hope, um, you know, I hope I don't I step too much on, on the visibility with my appointment and my announcement of um, my new role today, but I figured um, it's a nice way for me to uh, start the day with media and end the day with media, media where I can also talk about um, the issues that are so important to you and your communities. Um, when I, when thinking about setting the tone for this address, um, I found myself being reminded of the expectations given to me by queer Indigenous people when I began my doctoral research. Uh, their advice was that to listen, to carry and hold queer stories, I must be open, transparent and authentic. This mantra of being for queer Indigenous people reflects our predisposition towards and desire for the concept of authenticity. Um, unlike previous generations, there is a distinctiveness to authenticity currently being installed amongst my generation and successive generations, which is the crisis of cancel culture that is now fueling new concepts of authenticity. So the mantra conveyed to me has stayed with me um, and it continues to reflect my personal and professional brand, which is formulated by my experiences and lived realities. In essence, that mantra is to hear and know their stories. I must also tell my own. So I'm going to take this opportunity um, today in my first address as uh, the new commissioner to provide you um, with an overview of who I am um, and what I'm about, what my journey has been and where we're going. So I'm a queer Wiradjuri man, uh, known as the people of the Three Rivers, Wiradjuri people have inhabited modern day central New South Wales uh, for at least 60,000 years. At the time of British settlement, an estimated 3,000 Wiradjuri were living in the region, representing one of Australia's uh, largest Indigenous cultural footprints. Wiradjuri country is one of beauty. Now, I acknowledge that most Aboriginal people claim that their country is the most beautiful. However, the Western Plains of Wiradjuri country can really only be described as majestic. The Wiradjuri Nation is the second largest geographical clan group in Australia, extending from the, uh, the Great Dividing Range uh, to the east and bordered by the Macquarie, Lachlan and Murrumbidgee rivers. Today, Wiradjuri populations can be found throughout larger regional areas across New South Wales, such as Bathurst, Dubbo, Orange, Lithgow and Wagga Wagga. Condobolin, my hometown, is the Kalari people's homeland and is situated in the lower Lachlan region. Um, it is anecdotally uh, considered by other Wiradjuri communities to be the heartbeat of the Wiradjuri nation. 
Uh, Condoblin is a low socioeconomic rural environment currently suffering from severe climate change amid decades long socio-political isolation. This narrative is familiar to many regional and remote uh, communities. Uh, for young Aboriginal people who have grown up in these settings and for many LGBTIQ plus people um, who grew up in these settings, um, we're increasingly taking opportunities uh, that were not available to previous generations. As a result, young people leave their communities for higher education or employment opportunities, live in urban centres and lead more cosmopolitan lifestyles. This shift, uh, particularly for Aboriginal young people, is a result of an amplified strategy conceived by older influential people. So Indigenous Australians born between 1987 and 1992 entered a world where prominent leaders were pushing for significant Indigenous rights, self-determination and advancement in education, health and employment, demanding great significant change and a change in improved outcomes. Many of these leaders were amongst the first to seemingly occupy a seat at contemporary Australia's table. Their vision led to the success of a new generation of Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing. This was the generation that I was born into. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander visionaries guided, have guided Australian policy and political discourse to conceive a world that promoted and normalised a very simple idea uh, that an Indigenous Australian could finish high school, attend university and enter the workforce. As a generation, we were supported to participate and actively engage in shaping Australia's future. At the same time, the vision held that these futurised Indigenous Australians would, bring, would begin to break the cycle of Indigenous disadvantage and in doing so become a collective pillar um, of Indigenous excellence. This monumental task sought to change a series of deficit narratives held deeply by previous generations of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. While this change is still ongoing, the shift in narrative uh, continues to influence the lived realities of a generation that became the first to collectively graduate high school and attend university like other many other Australians. <clears throat> but since 2000, uh, Australia's corporate and political landscape has increased its strategic to strategic engagement of Indigenous reconciliation practices. In doing so, the growing success of wider Australia engaging with Indigenous peoples and communities have inserted new phrases like Indigenous excellence into the Australian lexicon. Comparatively, the first 20 years of this new millennium saw fairer and more equitable rights for Australian queer communities, allowing us to openly flourish. The complexity of race, culture, gender and sexuality provides an intersectional nuance that is slowly being grounded within research, knowledge, policy and practices amongst both First Nations and LGBTIQ plus organisations. For many decades, if not centuries, these two communities, Indigenous and queer, shared the troubled path toward victory and have fought many battles alongside each other. However, for those that have a foot in each camp are yet to feel the glory of acceptance within both settings. When queer people come out for the first time, it can be a remarkable personal experience. Uh, moreover, of course, when some people come out, they are met with violent, turbulent responses. Nonetheless, the journey of coming out allows oneself to uncover and display previously hidden traits and attributes. Uh, the process of coming out can often force a queer person to consider their desires, hopes and understandings of who they are now and how they are now seen. So in 2010, I took a road trip back to Rajri country to my hometown of Condoblin. At the time, I was living in Sydney and studying at the University of Sydney and working for New South Wales Health. Uh, that trip back to Rajri country was one that I'd done many, many times than I can really recall. However, it was a particular drive back home that was of reflective signif uh, significance. I was returning to my country for the first time as an out queer man. The drive across country allowed me to think about this and it forced me to consider who I was then and who I would become. On that trip, I also reflected on the complexities of my racial cultural identity, my inner being a Rajri person and my outer visible identity as being an Aboriginal person. Um, Aboriginal people are often asked, what does it mean to be Aboriginal? And for some Aboriginal people, it can be an, an easy 
thing to respond to uh, questions about Aboriginality. There are rules and protocols, clear boundaries and limitations. There exist historical, personal, public and self-determining responses. Uh, but on that trip back to country, I asked myself a question that I'd never previously considered. What does it mean to be a queer Wiradjuri person? I'm yet to discover an answer to that question, and that is partly because our ever adapting identities based on socio-political experiences often cause a rift in our understanding of our cultural selves. Uh, similarly, the perceptions of others moving between worlds on the concept of race, culture, identity, gender and sexuality can often produce a narrative of damage. When that narrative is reflected, we become skewed in our quest to fully reconcile our real individuality with the identities that are given to us. An example of this was, in, um, was when I graduated high school. Uh, I became the first Indigenous Australian in my high school's history to complete a HSC. Uh, to provide context, 20% of my high school student enrolments were Aboriginal, yet somehow I remained the first. At the time, I wasn't really aware of the significance of being the first. Throughout my upbringing and my secondary education, I was influenced by a narrative of Indigenous disadvantage. I believed that Indigenous deficit discourse uh, dictated the only margin uh, within which I could perform my Indigeneity. This soft bigotry of low expectations also fueled the concept that any form of Indigenous excellence or success was to assimilate. It meant that personal individual success was at the detriment of the community. This trope is intimately tied to historic colonial tropes about Indigenous Australians, which merely referred to the destruction of our cultures. Tropes like the last of his tribe forged a deep narrative within Australia's psyche. It signified that Australia's colonial expansion occurred at the expense of Indigenous disenfranchisement. And in many ways it did, and in many ways it does. Uh, my high schooling was filled with low expectations. I was never quite encouraged to understand uh, what success might look like but I would soon find out that other young Aboriginal people would have similar stories and realities. Because when I graduated high school, so did many other Indigenous Australians right across Australia. Many of us became the first um, in, our, in our families uh, to graduate. So in recognising the significance of the Indigenous mass graduation alongside increased strategic pressure by Indigenous Indigenous leaders, the Australian federal government financially supported Indigenous youth leadership programs across the country. So I, you know, in my youth, I attended about six national Indigenous youth programs. And during this time, I built a strong network of thousands of young Indigenous Australians. These people were also on a trajectory to break the cycle of Indigenous disadvantage and encourage their families and communities to achieve the same. Many of these people were also the first to graduate high school. Um, and during that time, we also attended, attended national leadership con conventions where we would meet hundreds of Indigenous Australians who were the first doctors, lawyers, academics, CEOs uh, and elders. Many of these people were in their late 30s and 40s. They were amongst the first to enter university, influence government from the inside and work closely with corporate institutions to pave the way and the road for future generations. And they were from all walks of life. They were rural, remote, young, old, rich, community smart, book smart, poor, fair, dark skinned, straight and queer. Before this, I had seldom met an Indigenous Australian who had made it, uh, let alone a queer Indigenous person who had succeeded. To see queer Indigenous people also breaking the cycle of disadvantage was an incredible and life-altering experience. My aspirations to succeed without compromising my identity were reflected back to me for the first time. These people, in many ways, prospered at rates that Indigenous people had never previously attained in modern Australia. When I entered tertiary education, I met and surrounded myself with like-minded individuals who envisaged a world built on personal Indigenous success and, wealth, success and wealth creation. During my time studying, I had the opportunity to be mentored by one of Australia's most prolific public intellectuals, Professor Marcia Langton. You know, I once saw Marcia at one of those leadership forums I attended at such a young age. I was in awe of and intimidated by her intelligence, desire and purpose to transform Aboriginal 
Aboriginal people and communities. Marcia Langton is one of those chief architects and visionaries who ushered a new generation that asserts and embodies Indigenous excellence. When the gate to Indigenous future prosperity was pried open, it was Marcia and her ilk that took charge in knocking down the fences, ushering in new tropes like the first of her tribe. For just short of a decade, I've been guided by her intellectual field of influence, and it has profoundly impacted my way of thinking and my way of doing. One value I learned from Marcia is, and hold it true, is that there is more to be done despite decades of showing up. Um, there is a, a type of community and nation building that once is a, was a figment of imaginations of past activism, but the reality of today's Indigenous Australians is a world filled with possibility without limitation. The world that was envisaged by previous activisms is a world in which I now live, and it is also a world in which um, many, many LGBTIQ people occupy. Queer Indigenous people um, express a desire to move their lives forward, but often experience structural roadblocks that hinder their chance of achieving tremendous success. So now more than ever, there is a growing need to produce literature on, by, and about queer Indigenous Australians, and people like Dr. Mandy Hemingway are doing that um, in tenfold. Uh, in closing, it seems that the, uh, the haunting theme of being the first uh, is a continuous thing in my life. And so, you know, I'm really happy to be a announced as the next commissioner for LGBTIQ plus communities. Um, in that, uh, I am the youngest uh, commissioner appointed um, in Victorian history, um, and I think perhaps Australian history. I'm also the first Aboriginal commissioner appointed to a commission outside of Aboriginal affairs. Um, and as excited as I am, I'm often reminded of my journey and my history and that kind of roadmap that I've built because it's not just similar um, to other Aboriginal people, but it's a very similar journey to many, many queer uh, people today, many, many LGBTIQ plus people. And I'm excited to be able to share that journey and bring that into the new role um, and to, into the vision of the next few years um, as commissioner. And as, I, as excited as I am um, to do that, I want to state very clearly and very upfront that under my leadership, I will continue to uplift, elevate and advance your concerns, your issues, your projects and your desires. Bi plus people for far too long have been on the margins of LGBTIQ plus communities, even though as a letter and as a group, you are a central figure in the rainbow community and the okay. rainbow acronym. So, like, Amber's in my Zoom so I just wanted to say that I see you, I hear you, chat, chat. and I thank you. Thank you. So thank you for that. Um, I think we have a small technical difficulties on Amber's side. Um, it's just a small technical glitch. Uh, so I might take this opportunity um, to, and I, I'm just looking at all the comments. You are all amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it, it is an absolute honor and a privilege pri privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Mandy Hemingway, uh, Hemingham, sorry. Um, uh, Mandy is, has, has led such an incredible discussion and uh, led some incredible resources, uh, sorry, research in this space. And I'm really, really excited to be able to share the platform today with them as we open um, this, this forum. Mandy, over to you. Thank you so much, Todd, and uh, thank you for sharing your, your journey with us. And yes. journeys and stories are something that um, are really important to share, especially for um, Black queer people. And that's something that I'm going to talk a bit about today. So, um, uh, so I've, I've had a, a bit of a diverse journey through navigating both my indigeneity and also my queerness um, as everybody has and one of the reasons why telling these stories is so important is the diversity that happens amongst these stories so even though we're all brought here by the same kind of reasons today to, to celebrate by visibility um, even each by story is so different depending on you know how you came to find your identity so that's something i'm going to talk a bit more about today as well um, as well as the diversity in indigeneity with so many different countries around um, these beautiful lands. So I'm coming to you from um, Jarug country today where I was um, born and bred, uh, despite being a Butchler woman. So that's where I'm coming from today. Um, also talk a bit more about my positionality before I go into um, some of the, the research and my story. 
Um, I am a queer sort of bi plus indigenous pale skinned educated femme gender queer woman. Um, and one of the things I'm going to be, or well, many of the things I'm going to be talking about today is what it's like to live as a person with multiple identities and both the inclusion and exclusion that that can bring. So I'm going to be talking a bit about a narrative analysis uh, that I sort of conducted. So it's an autoethnography uh, piece that I'm going to be talking about today. Some of you might have heard it before. So it, it covers a few different things. It, talks about my, my Muru, so my, my journey, and that the two different journeys I'm sort of talking about here is my indigeneity and also my queer research journey. I'm also going to be using borderland theory to explore the difficulties faced by the BIPLUS community, as well as the complexities of identity multiplicity, which, you know, in this particular instance is indigeneity, um, queer, two other things. Um, I'm also going to be talking a bit about internalised phobias, so homophobia, biophobia and racism and its impact on performative self-expression of identity, as well as um, some aspects of institutionalised racism and shadism and how all these things kind of tie together to impact social and emotional well-being. So just to talk a bit more about why narratives and why stories are so important, um, particularly for, for marginalised people, is it disrupts the status quo. So it's a real disruptor of heteronormative masculine, white, middle and upper class stories and research that, uh, that exists. It also gives a lot of power back to marginalised communities and individuals. And it also captures a lot of the nuances that are often missed in qualitative research. And it also sheds a lot of light on just the sheer diversity of experiences that we all share. Um, so while there's some commonalities, every story is so different and that can make it um, very hard to, to get those voices heard sometimes. Um, however, sharing these stories makes us stronger together and builds our collective resilience as a community. So again, that's why it's really important to share these stories um, with each other and with everyone, particularly in research as well. So I mentioned before that I'm going to be uh, talking about what it's like juggling a multiplicity of identities using borderland theory. So um, borderland theory was developed by um, Gloria Anzaldúa and uh, based on her lived experiences living between the two cultures of Mexico and the USA, so living on the border, and how difficult it was to hold on to two cultures, particularly two cultures that have a power imbalance. Um, now, both borderlands and, and queerness are very fluid concepts. They've been described as being um, law for land theory has been described as being an unstable, unpredictable, precarious, always in transition space, lacking clear boundaries, um, very similar to queerness. Um, so they're both kind of movable, hard to define and confine. So when we're looking at borderland theory and identity multiplicity, particularly for bi identities, bi plus identities, we're talking about um, how, how sexuality is understood as a real monosexist binary. So uh, monosexist means um, attracted to only one gender. So that's when we, we see a lot of people looking at the world as people being either straight or gay. Um, so there's no acknowledgement of, of bi plus identities because that's sort of the, the society that we live in, this very monosexist lens. Um, so because of that, so many bi identities are erased, invisible, unheard. Um, and as we all know, there's such a big fight for inclusion and recognition in both heteronormative and homosexual communities and cultures. And these diverse experiences from um, additional identities such as you know, ethnicity or prior sexual or gender identities, age, marital status, all these things impact the diversity of a bi plus existence. And um, living in this very narrow monosexist view that um, that society has just means that all these things are even further kind of pushed down and erased. Um, and as a result, it can be really hard because sometimes there isn't much commonality with your peers. So even within the community, it can still be a really isolating experience. And living on, on this borderland between these two kind of worlds, um, there's this kind of crossing the border phenomenon where there's the threat of being like caught or expelled. So, you know, feeling like a fraud, no matter if you're hanging out with straight friends or other queer friends. And um, it's something that so many bi plus people experience. And it's a real 
uh, double-edged sword of both privilege and isolation where you can sort of, um, you know, camouflage yourself in one group but still feel very isolated while doing that. So it's a real double, double-edged sword effect there. Um, and what's, what's kind of interesting is the parallels between this experience as well as also having an invisible race. So um, as an example, I'm a pale-skinned Indigenous woman. A lot of people don't think to ask if I'm Indigenous or at times even haven't believed me that I am. And I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, so from, from what we do know of existing research, um, there's, there's quite low mental health rates for both um, those in the BIPLUS community and Indigenous youth. So when we think about what the experience must be like for Black BIPLUS people, um, we can imagine that that must be very difficult. So that's something that um, research-wise I'm moving into that space of as well to explore a bit more. Um, on top of that, we do know that having a multiplicity of identities does likely contribute to overall poor mental health outcomes. Um, for example, um, almost 59% of BIPLUS people experience high or very high so psychological distress compared to the 11.7% um, of the general population. And we can also see some similarly alarming results for Indigenous youth. Um, who also experience high to very high levels of distress, which is 2.4 times higher than non-Indigenous young people. Um, so again, while both of these groups individually um, experience such high levels of, of um, psychological distress, um, this, this doesn't even add in the complexity of having these two and more identities. Um, so that's why exploring these stories and doing this research is so important. Um, now, I also want to talk a little bit about the narrative analysis that I did. So I was um, doing a Zoom session for a BIPLUS kind of casual meetup, and I was, of course, early, so I recorded, you know, started recording from when I logged on. And what I noticed in that time while I was waiting for people is I, I started to exhibit some very odd behaviours. So I'm just going to read a small excerpt of, of what I observed when looking back at this video. I played the video recording of the session. There was eight long minutes of only myself on the screen as I'd logged on and prematurely hit record. I hadn't planned on self-observation, but the opportunity presented itself. As I peered through the looking glass, she became a distal character before me. I immediately felt vulnerable. Watching yourself alone says more than I ever could have imagined. Watching her, I recalled feelings of inadequacy. Did I look queer enough to host and facilitate a queer workshop? I saw her obsessively tussle her hair, desperately trying to fluff it up into a more queer friendly style. I observed her putting on her rainbow earrings. She was repeatedly checking to see if they were visibly rainbow through the webcam, needing to flag her queerness. I began to realize just how fraught my body was with internalized biphobia and the accompanied craving for belonging. So queer flagging is something else that um, is very difficult for bi people as a as a community that can sort of slot into anywhere, it can make it very difficult to, to tell or you know, signify to others like, hey, we're here. Um, and so that's, that's something that I was very curious about. Um, so enacting these sort of queer aesthetics really emphasize the role that, um, that doing gender can also play when we're looking at um, expressions of sexual identity and the need for enacting and negotiating projected identity really shows this desire for acceptance from our peers and from others. Um, it also highlighted a real big fear of rejection, um, you know, something that, that happens in multiple communities. As a result, it sort of builds up this sense of internalised biphobia of never feeling queer enough or feeling like you belong. Um, I see this quite a lot in uh, particularly people who are in straight passing marriages. There's a real massive erasure that happens after that. And, um, can be a very isolating experience. Um, on, on top of that, it's very hard to, as a bypass person, to express yourself in a way that doesn't isolate yourself from one community or subset of dating experiences or the other. So it's always this kind of code switching between worlds that can happen. And a similar thing also happens um, culture-wise as well. So, you know, there's a lot of code switching that happens when, um, talking to mob or, you know, talking to non-Indigenous people. And it can be a lot of different hats to kind of juggle at once. 
um, looking at, at this video of myself also made me think about um, other factors like how I was how I was trying to move my hair and not only was it to, to make it in a very queer style but I noticed that I'd straightened my hair as well. I had um, you know so there's also that kind of internalized racism of not letting like my, my, my fluffy hair kind of show as well so it's sort of this this multi-leveled um, you know internalized phobias that that you know we all very unknowingly do every day in attempts to fit into one world or the other when looking at through this borderland kind of lens um, and another sort of part of this journey that I've had is the real yearning for identity um, so the you know to talk a bit more about my muru to embrace embracing my um, indigeneity I have an adopted mother so she's been very disconnected from her mob and her people um, so there's a lot of severed connections there from kinship history country and culture um, it's always one step forward two steps back when when trying to dig back through our family history and I'm certainly not alone in these experiences as there are so many um, Indigenous Australians who have come from stolen generations um, have been moved from their families from their land and um, so it, it's still very very hard to not only connect with with mob and country but also to even learn about it can be very difficult and there's there's something that's uh, very uncomfortable about trying to learn about my own black history through very white fellow ways of reading about it rather than listening to it being told to me uh, as it as it should be as it should be. Um, however, I have been able to previously attend some great cultural classes locally at an Aboriginal community centre, and that's been incredible in terms of helping me be able to learn about culture and about mob the right way through story sharing and acceptance and celebration, which has been fantastic. Um, just to also quickly go over some more um, shadyism and institutionalised racism. Um, I'm going to just quickly share a, a brief story about what happened when I went to a nurse's office one day. Um, so of this, um, I was very nervous walking into the nurse's office prior to my operation, sat down, went through all the usual questions. Um, she got to the question that I always dread. So Mandy, are you Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? She asked while well, not looking up at the form. Yes, I replied. Oh, she paused and her eyes darted from the page. I could feel her eyes scanning me, scrutinizing my appearance. You don't look at it all. Look at your red hair. Well, I am, I said assertively. I was tense. Despite my vigilance, it still catches me off guard. It's hard to stay assertive when someone is questioning your identity, your very essence of your being. Okay, then, Aboriginal. You're sure? Yes, I repeated, trying not to sound too defensive. She raised her eyebrows in disbelief and continued to fill out the form. Now, I'd like to say this is an isolated experience, but it definitely is not. Um, so there were a lot of firm reminders in that experience about the difficulties of even disclosing identity and how even in a healthcare setting and educational settings as well, and the general public as a result of colonial education in the Australian school system, um, you know, there, there's always questions surrounding my indigeneity um, because I don't look Aboriginal, despite knowing that we all look very different. Um, so it just goes to show how many institutions of power um, have so much of an impact, how much colonialism still has an impact on how people view us. So just to kind of bring all of this together, um, it creates a real cycle of internalised phobias and a real yearning for peer acceptance uh, as we try to navigate these different worlds, as we try to fit into these different worlds um, and, and the constant rejection but yearning for acceptance um, you know sort of reaffirms these internalized phobias and connection building um, you know we, we desperately feel like we don't belong and as a result we really need to belong um, and this also in turn impacts how we visibly project our sexual identity to others or how we try to and um, and this all gets internalized as a result of the constant community rejection and just makes us you know really yearn to belong even more so um, as a result, this is sort of really driven where I'm taking my research to explore more of these stories um, to see, you know, how, how other people have experienced having a multiplicity of identities and how that's impacting their social emotional well-being. So 
things like this, this event and this keynote are so important because we really need to be hearing more of these stories, um, not just to empower ourselves, but to be able to um, help others in the future by showing policy and, and various infrastructure what we really need. Uh, so thank you so much for, for listening to that. Um, um, I also want to say thank you so much to Todd for your words as well. And I think something that has come through really very strongly in what each of you has shared and in what I'm seeing in, in the chat is the, the power of sharing narratives and being authentic and, and challenging the traditional and, and powerful dominant course that, that's out there in, in societal narratives. So I'd like to throw a question to each of you in our final moments here. Um, and that's in, in some spaces, there are these increasing conversations about the role of colonization and how it's eroded um, queer indigenous identities and histories. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what impact this has had on, on broad societal narratives of queerness and, and Mandy in the context of a monosexual society? Um, that's a really, really important question, um, Amber. And, you know, when we look at the history of colonization and the arrival of the European, um, you know, invasion, as some put it, but rightfully, um, you know, the, the, the lands on which they uh, arrived were occupied, uh, occupied not only with bodies, but occupied with customs, cultures, traditions, and importantly, laws. And so when, um, you know, when, when the British colonial team <laughs> arrived on these lands and uh, announced it as uh, terra nullius, it brought with um, them the laws of British, uh, the laws of, of England. And that law also included um, the Buggery Act, uh, a law that was passed in the 1500s um, that outlawed homosexuality um, and uh, used it as a way in which to suppress uh, those, those identities is. And so when that law became enacted here in Australia in 1788, it immediately made homosexuality on these lands illegal, where for thousands and thousands of years across thousands of generations of queer Indigenous people, their existence, their bodies, their identities, their desires was immediately wiped. That is not only the case for Australia, but for every First Nations community globally in which they experienced the um, you know, the onslaught of, of European invasion. And that has remained the case. You know, Amber, you talk about erosion. Queer Indigenous identities were being eroded at the same time that Australian queer identities were evolving on these lands. That dichotomy is something that we need to talk about. It must be present because what it means is that we have to start challenging the lens in which we view the acronym LGBTIQ+. Um, one of the reasons why I identify as queer is because it means that I can build my own definition of what queer means rather than identifying as gay which the west cultural lens of, has infiltrated what it means to be gay what it means to be a lesbian what it means to be bi plus um, and so really um, you know queerness in in adapting in that way allows us to um, put forth our cultural identities um, amid our sexual identities in a way that pushes us forward. And Mandy's research about broader, border communities um, and border theory does that, does that in a really, really nuanced way, um, which I think is going to be um, something that will, you know, absolutely make make your contribution, Mandy, uh, an incredible point and, and fixture in, in research on, on sexuality. Yeah, just to, to kind of build on that, um, homophobia began in Australia the second that invaders stepped foot on these lands. There was, um, there, you know, every, every country that's here had their, their own understandings and um, interpretations and ways of being in terms of sexuality and gender in a lot of places as well. And as soon as these lands were invaded by, um, by the British, that's when things like the Buggery Act came into, into being and these attitudes and, and you know, through, um, you know, especially through a lot of the imposition of, of Christianity and things like that, these all 
all these pre-existing things that have been here for thousands of years started to be eroded and it's it's very difficult because even even now there are um, even some of our own people um, have some homophobic views but those in itself come from colonization in the first place and so even within our, our own tribes and within our own countries there's a lot of disagreement about sexuality and sometimes about gender as well um, because of you know a couple of hundred years of, of colonization and the impact that that has had so not only did it happen the second that um, the British stepped foot on here but it's something that has impacted generations and generations of, of changing values that had already existed for so long and so now is the time to tell our black queer stories and to be proud mm. of queer stories and to really bring those to the forefront to say that um, we're here, we always have been here. Um, it's time to start listening. Yeah, and that, that story, that history, that narrative is queer LGBTIQ plus history as well. You know, the reason why it took us so long to, to legalise gay marriage was because of colonialism. And, you know, we can't, you know, it's, it's, it's I think what Mandy and I are getting at at the core of our conversations is come with us on that journey. Be with us and stand by us, literally stand by us <laughs> when we share those those histories and those nar those narratives because it's yours as well. Um, you know, it's it's we we often use the the race and the cultural lens as a way in which to differ differentiate, but that's just differentiating an experience. The experiences that we all have when it comes to sexuality and comes to gender identity is the same story over the last two hundred years. Um, yeah, we connect to it different, but at the end of the day, in order to unlearn that practice, unlearn that history, we have to do it um, in a collaborative way. I think that's I have a, such question. a powerful, powerful message for folks um, here to, to listen to and to sit with. And I'm seeing lots and lots of comments in the chat reflecting that, um, well, reflecting gratitude for speaking and sharing and also um, um, appreciation for, for um, bringing these conversations to the forefront because they're not always present. Um, and, and as you've both highlighted so powerfully, it's, it's absolutely critical um, in these spaces. Um, I'd like to ask in our last few minutes, if there's anything else that you, you'd like to chat about while we're here today. Yeah, I have a, um, uh, a question for uh, that, that last comment in the chat is um, amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I have a question for Mandy. Mandy, what are you working on now? What's, what's going to be exciting? What are you, what are your, what's your, um, you know, your vision for your research? Um, because, you know, I've stepped out of the academic space now and, and I want to be able to hand over that bit baton to people like yourself to continue that that good work and that legacy um, but I'm really keen on understanding what's the what's the trajectory for you what's what's uh, an exciting research project that you're working on I'm sort of doing a couple of things so at the moment I am very slowly very slowly <laughs> uh, building a, a, a team of people to um, hopefully pull some funding together and do some qualitative research on all the different layers that there are to being black, queer, and young. So I'm essentially going to be looking at the social and emotional well-being of Indigenous queer youth, and I want to do that by um, not just you know having a, a yarn with with our young people, but also by um, looking at all the the individual ways in which people are trying to connect with identity. So whether that being how they're connecting back to, to mob back home or how they're connecting to the queer community or how they've become their own community. So um, also looking at things like what spaces are online and how, how are we all interacting with that space and how are we doing it through performance, for example. Mm. Amazing black queer um, performers out there who are doing yeah. incredible work and, and I'd love to chat to them and talk more about what that means to them and how they using that medium to express their identity um, all with the ultimate goal of of being able to uh, produce some material to say hey here's what we're experiencing here is what we need uh, here are the the policies and the facilities that we need in in both education and in health and in other areas to make us feel valid and safe to be able to um, 
you know, go to a doctor to be able to go to university, you know, whatever, whatever we need. So, so that's probably the, the biggest thing that I'm kind of working towards at the moment. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And it, it feeds into, um, and I'd love to collaborate with you on possibly a chapter on this, because there was a chapter I wrote in my PhD thesis um, on spaces, particularly, you know, the, the archetypes of three different spaces that we occupy as Aboriginal queer people, that when we are together in our own space as Aboriginal queer people, that is a different space because we're not minimising or maximising either parts of our identity, but it is a shared thing. Whereas when we exist in queer spaces, we which often operate um, through a white ontology. Um, it, we have to minimise our blackness or our in indigeneity in order to be queer. Um, but when we're in an indigenous space, which is generally um, a heteronormative space, we have to minimise our queerness and elevate our, our indigeneity. So the, the dichotomy of the trichotomy of those three th three spaces is so so important. And queer people, you know, LGBTIQ plus people will understand that incredibly well because when we are in straight spaces we tend to you know minimize our queerness and for us it's the added layer of that racial cultural lens in which um works in that way so yeah that's that's amazing you're amazing you are so 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 powerful mandy thank you <laughs> thank you so much and yeah i i 100 agree you know there's there's so much code switching that we have to do depending on what space we're in so and that's what you know looking at this through the borderland like, theory lens is all about. Um, so what I'd love nothing more to do um, after I, you know, do a lot of, a lot more work in, in talking about, you know, borderline theory on, on all of these different uh, multiplicity of identities, I'd love to be able to just kick up that border and be like, here is our space as Black queer people. Mm -hmm. No more code switching. Mm -hmm. We're here. No more code switching. It's time to mm -hmm. rebuild our queer sites in ways that Australia, I don't think, is ready for, but nonetheless, <laughs> it's exciting times. Um, Absolutely. Amber, over to you. I've got to run soon. Uh, I just want to extend my deepest, deepest gratitude to you both for being here today. And I've just absolutely loved listening to this conversation and holding this space with you. And would also like to say thanks so much to everyone for us attending today. Um, there's heaps and heaps more events on as part of the Stand By Us conference. There's still time to get your free tickets. But most importantly, um, please keep in mind the conversations and the stories that have been shared today and, and bring them forward as we know this work doesn't stop once the Zoom closes. Um, and so I'd really, really encourage you to keep engaging. Um, and really, I, I just can't say thank you enough to you, Mandy and Todd. Really, really appreciate it. You both are legends. No worries. Thank you, Amber. And can I just say good luck, everybody, and all the other presenters. Um, I look forward to receiving an update um, from the organising committee on some of the outcomes and um, strategic vision that you all would like to see, um, and particularly for those folks in Victoria. Um, you know, give me hell. Send it all to me. Tell me your vision. Um, here we go. You know, there's a there's a new chief gay in town, and and I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Todd. Happy Bi Plus Visibility Day, everyone. Take care.